Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, friends and colleagues from all over the world. I hope that you're keeping safe and healthy. Welcome to this panel session on preeclampsia, which the World Health Organization has organized to amplify the message of the winning film for the 2022 Health for All Festival in the Universal Health Coverage category. Today, I have with me distinguished individuals from maternal and prenatal health community, from patient advocacy community, as well as health communication community, to take a look at this topic from a different perspective. So why is preeclampsia an important condition that everyone, particularly future parents, should be aware of? So preeclampsia is a leading cause of death and serious illness of pregnant women and their babies worldwide. Despite intensive research and advances in medical care, preeclampsia remains a mysterious disorder in obstetrics, and we still don't know enough. But the good news is that it can be identified and treated early. Preeclampsia does not spare any racial or socioeconomic group. You know, you have it in high-income countries, you have it in low-income countries, you have it in middle-income countries. Preeclampsia is a disease condition characterized by high blood pressure and presence of protein in the urine of the woman. And when this condition happens, it is a multi-systemic disorder that is, it affects all organs and systems, and it can affect them in different ways. Um, but the good thing is that if a woman is able to attend to start antenatal clinic early, part of what is done during antenatal care is blood pressure monitoring. Our panelist is Ms. Lorena Benor, a seasoned communication specialist with experience working in technology industry, as well as development sector. She's currently working for the Health for All Film Festival. In this panel, she'll be representing the views of young women who aspire to be future parents in Colombia. So to get the ball rolling, I'm going to call on Lorena first. So please tell us a little bit about the processes for the Health for All Film Festival, the health education goals, and how this film speaks to the objective of HAV. Over to you, Lorena. Thank you so much, Femi. It's a real pleasure to, to share today this session with you all. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, so yes, so the Health for All Film Festival, which is the film festival of the World Health Organization, was created as a tool to to create a, a new approach of promoting and educating about different health issues around the world. So the festival was a real huge success. We had had 3,500 participants so far from all over the world. We have 110 countries already submitting their films to the festival. So if you want more information about it, you can check the website that you will see in the, in the screen. Talking now about the film on preeclampsia that we are going to watch today, it, this film was the winner of the, the Universal Health Coverage category, which is a category that, that was created to address one of the major public health goals we have in the world, no? the access to health care. So you will see in the film the difficulties of a condition that is not that well known among pregnant woman and how that can be prevented. And after that, you will see uh, that Sharon Stone, who was also one of the jurors for this edition of the festival, that will give her remarks about this topic and how it was so important for her that she also championed for this film to be the winner of this universal health coverage category. Thank you so much and let's see the film. Kehamilan, perjalanan magi serta religius selama 280 hari untuk kehidupan baru yang lebih indah. Kehamilan bukan hanya kebahagiaan sebuah pasangan, tapi juga untuk seluruh keluarga besar mereka. Di saat itulah kehidupan manusia bermula. Kebanyakan kehamilan berlangsung indah, namun ada juga yang tidak sesuai harapan. Seorang guru kami mengatakan kehamilan itu seperti kondisi saat hujan. Kadang berakhir pelangi, kadang berakhir petir dan badai. Salah satunya adalah preeklamsia.
ini adalah cerita kehamilan kedua ibu Dian Dimana di kehamilan pertamanya Bayinya meninggal di dalam kandungan saat usia kehamilan 28 minggu Akibat ibu ini mengalami preeklampsia. Tensinya tapi kan gak turun-turun kan Setiap cek-cek gak turun Sampai akhirnya uh, Nak tambah naik tuh Sebenarnya awalnya mau cek Ini uh, udah mau trimester 3 kan Bulu hati itu sakit Terus kita ke klinik ternyata potensinya udah 160 per 100 gitu. Langsung dirujuk untuk uh, apa namanya? Rawat inap. rawat inap gitu. Nah, selama rawat inap itu ternyata makin parah gejalanya udah pusing, udah mata kunang-kunang seperti itu yang gejala khas preeklampsia kita tahu ya pas sudah selesai itu kan kita langsung cari tahu oh emang ini ternyata gejalanya Preeklampsia adalah kondisi di mana seorang ibu hamil secara tiba-tiba mengalami tekanan darah tinggi pada usia kehamilan di atas 20 minggu yang dapat disertai dengan gangguan fungsi organ lain ibu maupun pada pertumbuhan janinnya. Preeklampsia merupakan salah satu penyumbang angka kematian ibu hamil dan bayi tertinggi di dunia. Sebanyak 76.000 perempuan dan 500.000 bayi meninggal akibat preeklampsia setiap tahunnya. 11 sampai 13 minggu itu di it ya di USG terus cek darah juga ya itu buat screening untuk ngecek berapa besar kemungkinan kejadian preklansia ke depannya cek aliran darah ke plasenta dari uh, apa yang di perut itu USG nya nah, si janinnya efeknya apa dia kecil bayinya ya kan terus ya bisa juga suatu waktu dia nggak ada yang kayak riwayat yang pertama itu, ya kan? Nah ke ibunya seluruh organ, pak, seluruh organ dia bisa dipengaruhi mulai dari kepalanya, otaknya, ya kan, pembuluh darahnya. Karena racun ini kan dia beredar di pembuluh darah, jadi dia disirkulasi baik ke ibunya maupun ke janinnya, gitu. Nah makanya ada preeklampsia yang kena ke ginjal, jadilah dia proteinnya bocor di situ, ya kan di urinnya itu ketemu protein kan dulu kan kalau preeklampsia. Terus di otaknya bisa suatu saat kejang, kayak gitu-gitu. Nah, sampai saat ini sih Alhamdulillah semua terkontrol. Ya kan, pertumbuhan bayinya oke, okay, ya kan. Ibu tekanan darahnya oke. Okay. Hasil-hasil lab juga sejauh ini insya Allah baik. Nah, mudah-mudahan nih sampai nanti 38 minggu semuanya oke, okay, Pak. Bismillah ya, Bu. Kemudian lancar ya. Ya, ini kita udah berjuang, tinggal kita serahkan sama Allah lah. Ya. Yang penting kita udah, 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 udah usaha tinggal hasilnya kan udah ada yang ngatur pak ya. Sebenarnya yang paling dikhawatirin itu kalau tensinya naik sih. Nah, sampai sejauh ini sih masih uh, normal normal terus. itu udah lebih tenang sih kalau itu karena udah terpantau. Sampai saat ini kehamilannya sudah 36 minggu dan alhamdulillah sejauh ini kondisi bayinya dalam kondisi baik, pertumbuhan bayinya baik. Ibunya juga dalam kondisi baik, tekanan darahnya terkontrol, dan sampai saat ini tidak ada tanda-tanda gangguan di organ-organ ibunya. Dan kita akan mempersiapkan untuk persalinannya secara sesar di usia 38 minggu. Ya, harapan saya ya hmm, anaknya sehat sih, sama istrinya juga sehat ya. Persalinannya juga lancar nanti, nggak ada kendala apa-apa sih. Itu aja sih.
Pada akhirnya, malaikat kecil yang dinanti menjadi pembawa kebahagiaan untuk keluarga mereka. Meskipun peristiwa yang lalu masih memberikan luka yang teramat dalam, yang tak bisa dilupakan. Banyak ibu hamil yang belum teredukasi mengenai pentingnya screening preeklampsia di awal kehamilan. Walaupun sebenarnya sebagian risiko preeklampsia dapat dideteksi lebih awal sehingga dapat dicegah komplikasinya. Alhamdulillah sih seneng banget luar biasa nggak udah nggak kebayang lagi bahagianya kayak gimana. Pas senangnya pas ya dipanggil masuk pas ini <gih> ngajarin anaknya kayaknya lega aja gitu udah nanti yang lama. Ya bayinya juga ya, sehat. Bayinya juga sehat, istrinya saya juga sehat. This film was so well made. There are things in this film that just moved me particularly. The film shows very specifically what preeclampsia is and what it does. Preeclampsia is a condition that women who are pregnant can get. And it is one of the top four leading killers of women worldwide. It is not known or understood or looked at in the very, very important, needed way that it should be. This film is spectacular, and it is so inclusive. It is so well shot. It is inclusive of the father, which I thought was so important, especially because we look at pregnancy as how do we treat the mother? Does the mother have rights? Do we take the mother's rights away? How is the mother going to take care of this child? Does the mother have the rights to pregnancy? I think it's very important that, remem that we remember it takes two people to create a pregnancy. And I loved that this film included the father. We see it as it's happening, we see the consequences of it happening, and we see the consequences when they are handled correctly, and the life and death moments of what it means when you have preeclampsia. I strongly urge you to understand the very, very important need for health care for everyone on a global level. Thank you very much. We want to say a big thanks to Sharon Stone for supporting the Health for All Film Festival, especially for this category. We also have with us Dr. Joyce Brown. Dr. Brown is a medical doctor and an epidemiologist. She's currently an assistant professor of global health at the Gillis Center for Health Services, Health Sciences and Primary Care at Utrecht in, in uh, Netherlands. And she was a member of the jury that reviewed the films in the UHC category of half for 2022. Joyce, based on your experience working with the film festival, do you have any kind of feedback from the jury, jury deliberation? What was very special about this film is that it shows the power of film. So it showed us the story of a woman, the context she works in, her family, and how they are all important to her care. Um, and it's also a story of hope because we know with access to available, affordable, and acceptable care, it can be of high quality. So also in that respect, it's a movie that champions the reason why the Health for All Film Festival was established. So though preeclampsia complicates approximately 2 to 4% of pregnancies globally, it is responsible for approximately 500,000 fetal and newborn deaths annually. I particularly like the intro part of the film where it says pregnancy is like rain. 
Sometimes it hangs in a rainbow, but at times it hangs in thunder and storm. Incidentally, the word eclampsia itself was derived from the Greek, an, an ancient Greek word, which means to shine forth, you know. And when I was watching that clip, that, was, that rang a bell with me, similar to lightning, you know, which is unexpected and which sometimes could be detrimental. And I also like the fact that the, the father was involved in the journey. You could perceive his joy as he was praying for that, for the baby, you know, after the baby was born. We have with us Adli Nanda Alfata, an obstetrician gynecologist and one of the co-founders of Indonesia Prenatal Institute, the winner of the UHC Grand Prix for Head for All Field Festival. Adli, you've had several comments from, from the panelists about the film, including that from, from Sharon Stone. Do you have any reaction to that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Femi, and thank you for all your support and positive comments to our short movie. And also, uh, thank you, WHO, for arranging this uh, panel discussion with a very important topic. Uh, actually, we want to highlight two points as the important key message of uh, the short movie. First, we want to remind all of us that uh, preeclampsia is a real condition affecting pregnant women, and it could lead to that like the first pregnancy uh, of this woman in the short movie. The, the first pregnancy ended up with intrauterine death. Moreover, there are more cases that may end up with uh, neonatal death, maternal death, and other uh, serious complications. Second, the early prediction and prevention program are uh, considered as one of the important things to beat preeclampsia. Uh, before being pregnant, a woman needs to ensure uh, her body is in the most optimal health condition, by achieving the optimal BMI, consuming adequate nutrition, doing optimal exercise, and controlling the other diseases or morbidities. And also at the first semester, uh, especially at 11 until 13 weeks of gestation, we recommend performing the combined screening so that the risk uh, could, be, could, be pres could be calculated more, more accurately and the prophylaxis intervention uh, could be pres prescribed earlier by the physician. And afterward, the close, uh, monitoring of signs and symptoms should be applied to the high-risk woman. So we call this approach by the early and comprehensive prediction and prevention program for, for preeclampsia. Thank you so much, Hadley. Uh, that was very interesting to hear. And now with advancement in technology, there are you know, home-based devices that women can actually use to monitor their own blood pressure. Some of them can actually signal when the blood pressure is not good so that the woman can seek healthcare as appropriate. So as long as there is constant monitoring of blood pressure, when it gets elevated to a certain level, the healthcare providers can intervene by providing anti antihypertensive agents if necessary to control the blood pressure. At the same time, they continue to monitor the baby and the mother, and they only intervene if necessary. One thing we haven't mentioned is that the key intervention for curing quote-unquote preeclampsia is delivery of the baby. So as long as the pregnancy continues, the condition itself, we can control it, but we cannot really stop it. It's a progressive disorder. In some women, it's, you know, it gets aggravated very quickly. In others, it gets, you know, it's a little bit slower in, in the way that it, it, uh, it emerges. Yes, Femi, just to understand, it affects the mother and the baby. But, you know, to understand, is it the same, um, same severe, how severe it is for the mother and the baby? Is like the same or the mother will always survive and the one in risk is the baby? Yeah, I think both of mother and baby uh, will get uh, the impact of the, this preeclampsia. It depends on the... On the types of the preeclampsia um, for the baby it can be uh, it can be got a, so a small small a small birth weight and an intrauterine growth restriction or, or, or even the uh, intrauterine fetal death like the woman in our short movie and for uh, for the mother uh, the, the the spectrum of the disease uh, is very broad uh, the, the complaint can be if, uh, start from the seizure, and then the problem of the blood and uh, 
and 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 the kidney, the heart, and the lung problems. So 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 uh, preeclampsia is a very uh, broad uh, range of uh, of disease. And last but not the least is Mrs. Koiwa Koilabi of Oso Apia, a social entrepreneur and the founder and executive director of Action on Preeclampsia, APEC in Ghana. And you being a patient representative on this topic from Africa, what's your take if you compare the Indonesian situation with what you, you've seen in Africa? regarding this topic. Okay, thank you, Femi. So it's a very good film and I could relate to it because I'm a survivor myself, a four-time survivor. Out of four pregnancies, um, I have only one surviving child. I have three babies who died as a result of preeclampsia, eclampsia, and health syndrome. And so it was very touching to, to, to watch the, the lady's story and related to what happens here. I think her experience is no different from mine or any other Ghanaian woman or any other African woman. You know, I think her first baby, with her first pregnancy, she lost it and it seems as if she was not much aware or there were some issues, but with the second one, they took steps to monitor her. Similarly, in my case, the baby I have alive is actually my second baby. And that's because there was extra care and extra monitoring and also because I patronized the healthcare services outside Ghana. In other words, I delivered outside Ghana. So it's almost the same thing. There is lack of knowledge. Ignorance killed my first baby, you know, and um, there's also the issue of our health system having the capacity and ability to manage the condition as effectively as they can. And so it tells you how this, this, this disease is actually a, a global disease and, and it's something that affects us all. And as a global community, even on this platform that we are on, we need to have that global joint effort to be able to deal and manage it. Because uh, no woman really should die given birth and neither should a child you know, be denied the chance of life because of conditions such as preeclampsia, eclampsia, or its related uh, conditions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Koa, for sharing your story. Preeclampsia doesn't show on the surface until it is quite advanced. As we used to say when I was practicing in, in uh, clinics, it doesn't show on the face. Therefore, to catch it early and to control it, it is important that those who are planning to get pregnant, those who are pregnant, their family members, as well as the healthcare providers that care for them, are aware that there's a disease condition that needs to be excluded at every opportunity when a pregnant woman comes in contact with the health system. This is important whether care is being sought in the community, at the primary care level, or at the tertiary institution. And several of the serious damage that it can cause to body organs can be averted. But in the spirit of universal health coverage, we need to be able to do more. UHC simply means access to quality care for everyone, everywhere, including the most vulnerable. So I'd like to, to ask the panelists, and, I, and, and let me know if you'd like to speak, what can health workers do to mitigate the impact of this condition on the women, their babies, as well as their families? And I want to add by responding and pulling in something Dr. Adler, Adley just said, and that was that early prediction, diagnosis, and prevention are key. And this allows women to know what risk factors they need to look out for, to, uh, to know about preventive strategies. And that's also something that's really important for health workers to realize. If you know which woman is at risk, you can suggest to her preventative proven strategies, such as the use of aspirin or with low calcium intake, uh, calcium supplementation. So there are things we can do to prevent. There are also things we can do once the disease occurs. We can monitor, and that's also what happened during Corey's second pregnancy. We can monitor pregnant women, make sure their blood pressure remains within adequate ranges or add additional therapies if need be. We can make sure that we monitor the baby so that we also don't forget the fetal heart rate and, and know the condition of the fetus so that we can also intervene when necessary. 
And ultimately, this requires a good and functioning health system that provides universal insurance and universal health coverage. Because one of the downsides and the, the even additional grievance that women experience after having gone through this condition is that they're sometimes left with an enormous bill that they then need to pay as well. The bill does not only include women's health care costs, but also the newborn's health care costs, NICU admissions, drugs that or therapies that the baby may need, they all contribute to very high costs. Koyowa? Uh, yeah, thank you once again. Um, in the context of UHC, I think in Joyce's earlier submission, she did mention that the healthcare system must be acceptable, it must be available, and it must be affordable. And in this part of our world, that is all three elements are not always the case. You know, because sometimes it is available in some areas, like the major cities, it is not available in other areas. In terms of acceptability, I'm looking at the capacity of the medical staff and the nurses to even manage the condition from the beginning to its severest form. And so recently, in our recent scientific symposium, one of the things that we identified was to enhance the capacity and competence of medical staff all the time and regularly. And I always use the story, even the experience of the woman, the Indonesian case, and my story as, as, as a as catalyst that it was the difference was with the management of the condition with my second child, even though the others couldn't be the same. And then the third one is affordability. Ghana, you know, is doing well in terms of its national health insurance, but then it only covers to some aspects. It only covers to after, let's say, consultation and, and a few labs. And a, but the bill, the economic burden is still there. Not only the medical economic burden, but even the burden of moving from your home to the hospital, you know, a hospital back, you know, having to take care of yourself as a, as a pregnant woman and all that. So there's still that economic burden. Ghana is doing so well, but we can do better. And in this part of our continent, we can actually do better. And because as you rightly said, the condition, eclampsia is Greek. And like Tanda and Greek, when it starts, it, it, it doesn't go up down. It just keeps going. And the pace at which it moves is just striking. Thank you very much, Koyoa. How is the blood pressure going to affect the mother? so bad that it it's almost fatal sometimes if it's not taken care of okay um hardly do you want to respond yeah uh, actually blood pressure is uh, the high blood pressure is just one of the manifestation of uh, preeclampsia preeclampsia is a multi organ uh, disorder so it can affect it uh, from the brain uh, the heart and lung uh, and the kidneys and also the blood vessels. So uh, when it affected the blood uh, vessels, it can lead to the high uh, blood pressure. Yeah, maybe just to, to add to that, I think Lorena also wants to know what the blood pressure does to the woman. Uh, just like high blood pressure can lead to cerebrovascular accident, what people call stroke, in the general adult population, a pregnant woman with preeclampsia can also develop stroke because the, the blood pressure can get so high as to bust a vessel in the brain. And bleeding into the brain will result in the manifestations of uh, a cerebrovascular accident, which could be fatal in, in some cases. The same way, if the blood pressure is too high, it affects all the other organs, including the kidneys, the, the high, you know, just about any organs you can name in the body. And sometimes a woman could have affectation of multiple organs at the same time, you know, and, and usually the, the outcome is worse for such women. And maybe um, if you would, uh, maybe if I can add, what is also very important about this is that often women do not experience or notice symptoms and then blood pressure when it's measured um, is the first sign. But sometimes women do notice um, something that is wrong with them. So they may feel very tired. They may see little sparkles of, of what we say fireworks in, in, in the Netherlands. They may experience very severe headache that they are not used to and just overall unease. So maybe, Koiwa, would you mind sharing what you experienced the times you experienced um, hypertensive disorders? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Joyce, for um, bringing out that because I think when as a patient organization, when you are dealing with a community or a group of you know people and you want to know let them to know the signs of these things, 
most of the time in our context, in the African context, the first thing will not be to sort of go to the hospital to check your blood pressure to see if it's high or not, or, you know, check your urine and stuff. So we need to be able to educate them on the signs that are so visible to them that they can, you know, pick on them and say, hey, let me go to the hospital and have my blood pressure checked, or in our context, sometimes to the nearest pharmacy. So in my experience, and as Joyce rightly said, you have that severe headache that just won't go away. It doesn't go away with any painkiller, whether paracetamol or whatever, and it keeps re recurring, you know, and then you have that blurry vision, you also feel extremely tired, even when you have done nothing, you sleep up, you sleep and wake up and you're tired, you're doing nothing and you're tired. And sometimes you have the epigast epigastric pain at the upper right here. And maybe you think it's something you ate or something that's causing an upset. But the key thing is the severe headache. It's, it's, it's a very unique headache. It's, it's so bad. You know, and so for some of us, with our, some of our pregnancies, we had blood pressure readings out of 150, 100. We had, with the one that I had eclampsia, you mentioned the stroke, I had an eclamptic fit. So at that time, my blood pressure was about 280, 100, and they had to do emergency CS to deliver. But in all of that was 150, 100, and you have all these symptoms. So as a woman or as a general community, even before you have the opportunity to check your blood pressure, I mean, if you have, the, if you have it at home, great. You monitoring it as regular as your doctor recommends or as you, you can. But if you are not, you, when you are pregnant, you should watch out for these things. Severe headache, blurry vision, you know, pain on the right side, and swollen feet. In our context, in the African context, sometimes when you have swollen feet, they tell you, oh, you're going to have a baby boy. You know, so the issues of ethnicity and cultural context also come into play. But then your feet is swollen because you're suffering edemia and that may lead to a serious complication. And so we need to have these basic symptoms. And so even as an organization, you know, Action on Pre-Eclampsia Ghana, one of our slogans is that know the symptoms, spread the word, consult your health professional. Thank you. It is extremely important if a woman experiences any of those symptoms that Koyawa mentioned to seek health care immediately. However, we should also recognize that development of symptoms is at the little part of the disease. It's, it happens when the disease is really, really advanced. And in fact, the outcome is not always so good. So as we were saying at the beginning of this session, Let's catch it early, as early as possible, so that we prevent preeclampsia when it's still a sign that we pick up, either by checking the blood pressure or by checking the woman's uh, urine for protein or running some other laboratory tests. At that time, we can still do a lot to prevent adverse outcomes to both mother and her baby. Uh, yeah, Femi, so... One just last uh, point that I would just want to have clearer is to understand if it's if I have problems with blood pressure, is like okay, I will have preeclampsia, or anyone can have preeclampsia. I just want to understand better this part. Anyone could have preeclampsia. That's why uh, we we have to highlight the importance of uh, early uh, screening and prevention uh, program. Even they who without uh, risk factors, the woman also can have preeclampsia. So in the early trimester of the pregnancy, all the women that visited in the antenatal clinic were, will undergo a number of examination at 11 until 13 weeks of gestation. We performed the interview about the condition and, uh, and the pregnancy history, and then we will measure the BMI and, and then also the blood pressure. Uh, and also, if available, the physician will, will perform a ultrasound and a blood test. And all of this data uh, will be used to calculate the individual risk and determine whether uh, the woman needs uh, low dosage aspirin or, or not as a prevention uh, measure. When a woman has certain risk factors, as Hadley was trying to point out, and as you said, Lorena, if a woman has pre-existing hypertension, she has a chronic hypertension before getting pregnant. That in itself could make her to have what they call preeclampsia superimposed on chronic hypertension. So if a woman already has hypertension before she goes into the pregnancy, she needs to get a doctor to know that that history exists because she, she, she's already in the so-called high-risk category. Lorena, just to respond to that, in my case, my mom had it. 
I'm a I'm a pre I'm a preeclamptic baby. My mom had it, and and so there, there's that risk factor of if a family member has had it. I didn't know till after the incident had happened. So there's even issue of communication. True, there's a family history of preeclampsia is also a well known risk factor. Well, everyone is of course at risk, but there are some women we want to be extra vigilant. So women with high BMI, women who smoke, women who have a family history, women who have pre-existing hypertension. You don't want to make it sound like you need to have those risk factors no. to get it. Some women don't have any factor and they still have it. Um, I see that we're all enjoying this session and we don't see, it doesn't look like we want it to end. <laughs> Maybe we have to have a follow-up, you know, of some sort, you know, in, in years to come. But I, I think this has been a very, very interesting discussion. We see value in joining hands to support this movie or this film for people who are not currently aware to be aware, especially young women, old women who are getting pregnant for the first time or people who have risk factors, who have experienced preeclampsia in their previous pregnancy or any type of hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. We've spoken about how you know, this film can support universal health coverage across countries, especially in low and middle income countries. Um, so with that, I want to thank all of you for your participation in this panel session. Dr. Brown, uh, Ms. Benal, Dr. Alfata, and Ms. Oposo Pear. It's been great uh, uh, moderating this session. I think we are good. Thank you very much. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you.